All right. So we're going to look at communion today because sometimes the church misses this. Communion is actually a lesson on love. Churches tend to argue about a lot of things about a communion service, this or that or something else. All kinds of arguments going on about what communion is, how often should you do it, who should do it, you know, and all that sort of thing. But, but I just want you to understand that this first communion service when Jesus gave it, it was part of a lesson of love teaching people how to really love. I want you to see this in John chapter 13, verse number one. And this is just right before Jesus conducts this, this um, communion service, this very first one. This is what he said. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Then he washes their feet, and then he does a communion service. But look at what that's all about. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And so we're going to look at how he washed their feet, and we're going to look at, at this co first communion service against the backdrop of him showing them the full extent of his love. Is, this is in keeping with our 2017 preaching theme of practical discipleship. And, and so today, we're going to examine another one of those things that disciples do. Disciples participate in communion services. You need to understand that. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're supposed to participate in communion services. And, and, and so then, after we, after we look at this lesson, we're actually going to conduct a 21st century communion service. And it's going to be as much like the first century communion service as we can make it. You see, it was Thursday of the final life, of the final week of Jesus' life. According to the Jewish calendar, it was the 14th day of the first month of the year for the Jews, and that was the month of Nisan. That was somewhere between mid-March and mid-April is when that, when that week typically begins on a Jewish calendar when compared to our calendar. But it was the 14th day of their first month of the year. Multiplied thousands of lambs were killed at twilight on the 14th. In the hours that followed, every household in Jerusalem ate the ancient Passover meal, which consisted of roast lamb and unleavened bread, bitter herbs and grape juice that had been preserved at the harvest time in goat skins bags. And this was the setting that John was describing when he wrote, it was just before the Passover feast. After washing his disciples' feet in a second-story room in a residence in Jerusalem, Jesus gave new meaning to that ancient Passover tradition by conducting the first communion service. That whole foot washing deal was part of what Jesus was doing when he was expressing to them the full extent of his love. Because you see, he took a towel and he, and he wrapped it around his waist and he began to wash the disciples' feet. And that may seem a little strange to us, but in the first century, that was very common. It was an act of hospitality. You see, if, if, if you were a guest in somebody's home, in order to get there, you had had to walk uh, a, a long ways over in a hot climate over dusty robes and you were wearing sandals and your feet would get grimy and gritty with the desert sand. And, and, and so it was very uncomfortable and, and, and very unpleasant. And so typically what a, what a first century Jewish a person would do who was hosting you as their guest would be he would get a, a basin of water and he would wash your feet. If he was wealthy, he had his slave do that. If he wasn't wealthy enough to have slaves, he did it himself. And so what Jesus did was he showed us that real love is the willingness to serve others in whatever menial and unpleasant way they may need to be served. He took on him the role of a slave. He got the basin of water. He poured the, uh, the, the water into the basin. He took the towel. He wrapped it around his waist. And then he began to wash the disciples' feet. It was a lesson on servant-heartedness driven by love. It's part of how you show the full extent of your love to the people around you. It's part of how Jesus wants to show the full extent of his love to people in our world today. He wants to do it through transforming us into servants who are motivated by simple love for other people. And I want you to understand this. When you just decide to love people, it doesn't matter what kind of people they are. 
It doesn't matter if they're the up and coming or they're the down and outer. It is, uh, doesn't matter if what the complexion of their skin is. It doesn't matter what mistakes they've made. It doesn't matter what successes they have. When you just decide to love people the way Jesus loves people, you just love people. And you're able to see beyond all of their stuff. And you'll be able then to begin to serve them out of a heart motivated by love. And you'll be willing to serve in whatever way they need. And that means that sometimes you got to get a little dirty. Sometimes you got to go into places that make you feel uncomfortable. Sometimes you got to do things that you normally wouldn't do, but you do it motivated by love because you want to show the full extent of Jesus' love to the world around you. And that's how he did it. That's exactly how he did it. And so after washing their feet, then he 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 gave new meaning to the ancient Passover tradition by conducting the first communion service. The first communion service was conducted in the middle of a Passover meal. And you remember the Passover was a was a, a festival that the Jews were commanded to keep every year from the time Jesus led them out of their slavery in Egypt until the day that Jesus was doing this and Jews ought to still be doing it today. It was a commemoration of the fact that God brought the ten plagues on Egypt and he brought them out of Egyptian slavery back to the promised land. It was a commemoration of the fact that when God sent the death angel over the whole land of Egypt and killed the firstborn in every household, if the Jews had, had killed a lamb at twilight and ate it, it like he told them to here with the bitter herbs and, and the unleavened bread and the grape juice. Then they, they put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. Every time he came to a house that had blood on it, he passed over that house and the firstborn did not die. And so this festival was called the Passover because God passed over the Jews in Egypt that night and didn't judge them. Instead, he delivered them. How many of you understand that Jesus is the Passover lamb? And that when the blood of Jesus is applied to you, when God begins to send the death angel to bring eternal eternal death to people who are non-believers. He passes over everybody that has had the blood applied to them. Do you understand that? That's what the blood of Jesus shed on the cross is all about. And so he went immediately with his disciples to the garden of Gethsemane, where they often camped for the night. Sometime after midnight, a mob arrived and Jesus was arrested. And one of the saddest scenes in the Bible is when his disciples fled. They ran out on Jesus when he needed him worst. He was escorted to the residence of, of Caiaphas, a palace in Jerusalem. Caiaphas was the high priest where he was tried by the Jews and condemned. Because Jews under Roman law didn't have the authority to enact the death penalty, they were forced to take him to Governor Pilate from whom they demanded a trial in a Roman court. And then early on Friday morning, Jesus stood trial before Pilate. He was flogged, humiliated, and finally sentenced to death by crucifixion. He was led to a place of execution on a hill just outside the gates of the city of Jerusalem. And by three o'clock Friday afternoon, he died on a Roman rack of torture and execution that we call a cross. Just before six o'clock Friday evening, his body was placed in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Sometime during Friday night and Saturday, Jesus made a journey to hell. Jesus went to the heart of the earth. And while he was there, he suffered everything we deserve to suffer spiritually because of our sins. Then at sunrise on Sunday morning, women came to his tomb and discovered that God had raised him from death. Jesus had made his way out of hell into the tomb, back into his body, and he had been raised from the dead. He spent the next 40 days appearing to his disciples and teaching them about his kingdom and proving that this certifiably dead man who had died on a Roman cross was alive. That's what Easter is all about. And then he ascended back to his father. None of these events was a surprise to Jesus. You see, that's what John meant when he wrote in, in the last part of John 13, verse number 1. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to his Father. It might not have been the route he would have chosen on the human side of him, but it was the route that God chose for him. He was going to leave this world by way of a cross, by way of a journey to hell and back, by way of an empty tomb, and then he was going to ascend back to his father. And he knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to his father. 
And then the next statement written by John is intriguing. In fact, if we miss this, we're going to fail to fully comprehend the significance of all that follows. Because he wrote this, and this is our text verse, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The question that demands to be answered is, how did Jesus show those disciples with whom he was eating the Passover meal the full extent of his love? How did he do that? The answer is found in the next four verses. John wrote this in, in John chapter 13, verses 2 to 5. The evening meal was being served. That's the Passover meal. And the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal and he took off his outer clothing and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus showed them the full extent of his love by serving them. People don't really care what you have to say unless it's backed up by what you do. Do you understand that? Many people are going to have to see love in action before they're ever going to believe that you love them when you just tell them that verbally. He's showing them the full extent of his love by serving them. In first century Palestine, travelers walked almost everywhere they went. So if guests arrived at your house... They had been walking along those dusty Roman roads under the blazing sun of a desert-like climate, and their feet would be tired and dirty. So in that culture, it was considered good manners and a routine gesture of hospitality to fill a basin with water and wash the feet of any guest who arrived in your home. As I said before, if you were wealthy, you would assign that unpleasant task to a household slave. But if you weren't too wealthy, you were expected to do it yourself. Jesus demonstrated the full extent of his love by voluntarily serving others as if he were a common slave. You get that? You get that? So you need to think of the most repulsive thing that you could ever be asked to do for anybody. And you need to bring that to Jesus. And you need to say to him, Lord, give me the grace so that I would even do that. Whatever it might be. Jesus demonstrated the full extent of his love through serving in a very unpleasant way. And then he said to his disciples, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. In that culture, that would have been a very relevant statement. In our culture, that might not make sense to us. But whatever anybody needs that might be unpleasant or repulsive to us, we need to be willing to do it. There's only one way that's going to happen. And that's if you learn to love people the way Jesus loved people. You got to see people the way Jesus sees people. You got to value people regardless of what they look like on the exterior because on the interior, we're all just alike. Needy creatures struggling to be more like Jesus. And so he says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. If I served you, then you ought to serve one another. And my friend, the only way in the world that we can serve Jesus is by serving the people of Jesus. It's only by serving like he served that we can serve him. And so he says, you need to do this. In other words, Jesus said to his disciples, you should serve one another. You should meet one another's basic needs regardless of what those needs might be. Genuine love is always expressed by acts of service. Jesus loved his own who were in the world. That's in John 13, 1. And then he expressed that love to them by acts of service. This is what he said about himself in Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to do what? To serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He came to serve and we're to follow his example. Paul explained the relationship between love and service when he said this, serve one another in love. That's in Galatians 5.13. Serve one another in love. If you serve people but you don't serve them because you love them, then the service is not appreciated and really not very effective. 
But when you serve because you love, and they can sense that love, and they, that just the way you relate to them, and the, and the body language, and the things you say, and the things you don't do, and the things you do, and the things you don't do, to, you know, it, it all communicates whether or not you really love them. And so you see, you serve one another in love. The two are inseparable. So when you love others, you serve them, regardless of how inconvenient, how lowly, how unpleasant, how disgusting, or how dirty that service might be. I tell you, I'm going to tell you a quick story. We really don't have time for this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Just be patient with me. Miss Jenny and I, I was 25 years old. We moved from northeast Arkansas up to central Indiana. We planted a church up there. God blessed in some incredible ways. But the first people who started coming to that church were these little street urchins. You know, these little kids that were basically living on their streets because their parents were addicts and alcoholics and, and, and you know, they just didn't have anybody caring for them and their parents didn't know where they were and they wound up in our house in church services. And some of those kids grew up while we were there and got to be teenagers. They were in high school. And, 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 and during the course of that time, the Lord put it on our hearts to keep some foster kids, so we took them in as well. And one of our foster sons was named Kevin, and, and Kevin was in high school, and and so Kevin uh, got to be buddies with one of those little street kids that had come to church and grown up to be um, 15 years old or so as well. And he grew up in a terrible dysfunctional home. And he was, and poor Jimmy was just dirty. And, and, and he would go to school and all the kids would make fun of him because he was dirty and he smelled bad. And, you know, they'd make fun of him. And, and so... Um, he was just really broken about that one day. And, and so Kevin, so it, Jimmy, what's wrong? And he said, they all make fun of me. I'm dirty and I smell bad, they say. And, you know, he was just broken about that. And, and, and Kevin said, Jimmy, we can fix that. You can come to my house and take a bath. And so he, kinda, he brings Jimmy in tow one day to our house to take a bath and to get cleaned up. And so I said, sure, Jimmy, you can take a bath. You know, I took him in the master bathroom. I said, here's the tub. Here's all the stuff you need. Here's towels. Here's wash rags. And so Jimmy was in there for a little while, and, and he came out. And, and I looked at him, and I said, Jimmy, that ain't good enough. You know, I know you find it hard to believe that I would tell him that. But I said, Jimmy, that's not good enough. That's not going to solve your problem. I said, you need to take a real bath. And he said, I don't know what to do. He had never been told how to take a bath. I said, don't you take a bath at home? He said, no, my mother has stuff piled up in our bathtub. We don't use a bathtub. I said, okay, Jimmy, you get in there and take those clothes back off and you cover up and I'm going to show you how to take a bath. And Jimmy had this, this matty brown hair. And so I began by washing his hair. And I just really didn't want to do this. But I began by washing his hair. And I washed his hair and we began to scrub I mean, scrub. He had, we thought he was kind of dark complected. He was as pale complected as he could be. And he had brown hair. After I washed his curly hair, it was as blonde as anything you could imagine. And he was fair complected when we got him all cleaned up. And he came out of the bathroom all cleaned up. I mean, you could have rubbed your thumb on him anywhere and he would have squeaked. And got him all cleaned up and brought him out. And Miss Jenny almost did not know him. And then he, I mean, it just brought a whole new confidence to him. He went to school and they didn't make fun of him and he was clean and they were amazed. And then from that point on, about every other day, Jimmy came to our house before he went to school in the morning and took a bath. Love. Just love. You know, and he felt like he could do that. Just because of love. So what I'm telling you is it doesn't matter how simple or disgusting or repulsive it may be to you to serve somebody. That's the way we're supposed to serve. And we do it out of a heart of love. And so that's the lesson that Jesus is giving them in this whole deal about washing their feet. He was showing them the full extent of his love. And we need to do the same. And that's why I say that genuine love is always expressed in acts of service and that we must serve one another in love. And that's why I tell you that we got to think of the most repulsive thing that someone you love might need you to do for them. And if you truly love them, you'll do it. And you won't moan and groan and complain about it. You'll just do it. And the more you love them, the more apt you are to smile while you're doing it. And you see, God set the example when he served us because he loved us. 
and he served us by doing something that I'm sure was very repulsive to him personally. He gave up his only son so that we might have eternal life. That was the greatest need we had, and God did it anyway. He served us because he loved us. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Eternal life. And so after skillfully painting a background of love by washing his disciples' feet, Jesus returned to the table and dramatized for them in advance the greatest act of love-motivated service in human history by conducting the first communion service. The story is recorded in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 28. It says, while they were eating, that's while they were eating the Passover meal, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now that hadn't happened yet. But he's about to dramatize for them what's going to happen. And it's going to be the greatest act of love-motivated service the human race has ever seen. Jesus is going to offer his body and his blood on the cross for our eternal rescue from the consequences of our sin. The bread and the cup of the communion service dramatize the physical suffering and death of Jesus. Love expressed in in, in the most selfless act of service ever witnessed by mankind. And the result? Eternal life is now available to every human being. Eternal life was available to Chris this morning because of what Jesus did on the cross over 2,000 years ago. Eternal life is available to everyone in this room Everyone in this county, everyone in this state, everyone in this country, everyone in the world because of what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. And that's what we're going to dramatize in just a few minutes when we conduct this communion service. Jesus served because he loved. And the foot washing scene followed by the communion service dramatizes that fact. John wrote, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And then he washed their feet and then he did this communion service. You see, love becomes visible and it is detectable when it is expressed by acts of service. Nobody knows how you love them unless they can see it in action. And that's what Jesus implied when he said, by this, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. They're only going to know it if you love them. And they're only going to know that you love them if they can see it by the way you express service to them. You see, when our love for others is expressed through acts of service, it becomes visible and detectable. And the result is that others then will identify us as followers of Jesus. May God help us to follow the example of our Lord who showed them the full extent of his love through acts of service because that's just what disciples do. Do you understand that here at the Open Door Church the reason we do so many of the things that we do is to show people that we love them so we can then tell people that Jesus loves them. Do you understand that? And so... That's just what disciples do. We serve because we love. We serve because we love. 